Hello, I'm Margaret Miller, director of the University of South Florida Contemporary Art Museum and Graphic Studio. I'm so pleased to welcome you tonight to a conversation, Printing Black America, W.E.B. Du Bois's Data por Portraits in the 21st Century, a talk with artist William Villalongo and urbanist Shraddha Romani. This talk will introduce you to William and Shraddha and the project they proposed to us earlier this year. As he will describe, Will has a history with us. In 2017, he co-curated Black Pulp with Mark Thomas Gibson at the Contemporary Art Museum. And his work was featured in a two-person companion exhibition titled Woke. Will has gone on to collaborate with Graphic Studio on two print projects, both recently acquired by the National Gallery in Washington, DC. The Contemporary Art Museum looks forward to sharing the progress made on this project in an upcoming exhibition titled Poor People's Art, a short visual history of poverty in the United States. Uh, this exhibition is curated by Christian Viveros Pone, our curator at large, and it's planned for the fall of 2022 and will continue through the spring semester of 2023. Poor People's Art explores the ongoing social and cultural significance of Martin Luther King's Poor People's Campaign and printing Black America will have a life of its own and be an important part of this exhibition. Now I'd like to introduce to you uh, Mark Fredericks. Mark is coordinating and directing this project with Will and Shraddha. He will give you a little more detail on how the project is evolving and, uh, and other participants. And then he will turn it over to Will and Shraddha. Mark. All right, thanks, Margaret. So tonight, Will Vialongo and Shraddha Romani will introduce us to Printing Black America, W.E.B. Du Bois's Data Portraits in the 21st Century. I should note that Will and Shraddha are joining us from Rome tonight. Uh, <clears throat> so <laughs> actually tomorrow, right? Uh, it's after midnight there now. Um, so this is, a, this is a huge project which brings the visual arts and data visualization together to reimagine Du Bois's groundbreaking data portraits of the early 1900s. The museum and graphic studio are assisting with the arts side of this project, but the need to acquire and analyze data is crucial. This allows for areas of entry into the project for the USF community. Several departments on campus have already lined up to support Shraddha Ramani and her research, including the Department of Anthropology, the School of Social Work, and the Judy Genshaft Honors College. And I see uh, Andrew Hargrove and Sandra Fogel are here tonight with us. So uh, we hope tonight's talk will spark further interest in the USF community and the broader community around this project. In the meantime, if anyone has questions for Will and Shraddha, they can put them in the chat or the Q&A function and uh, I'll present them at the end of the talk tonight. But for now, uh, let's turn this over to Will and Shraddha. Uh, I was gonna say good evening, everybody, but I got, yeah, it is evening. It's uh, early morning for us uh, here in Rome. Um, so what we're gonna do is, um, we're gonna talk about each other, our, 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 our respective work and, um, and what we do in our, in our sort of real lives. Um, I'm an artist uh, and I'm a professor, associate professor at Cooper Union School of Art um, in Strata, as uh, Margaret and, uh, and Mark said, it is, is, an, is an urban planner. Um, I should, though, before we get into anything, I should say thank you to both uh, Mark and Margaret for the introduction, and thank you to USF Graphic Studio for um, hosting this project. Um, I'm going to begin um, by talking about introducing my work. Shrada will introduce her work. Um, um, Shrada will talk a little bit about uh, the historic material that we're mining. Um, W.B. Du Bois's um, data visualizations from 1900 for the American Negro uh, exhibition 
in the Paris World's Fair, 1900. Um, and then I'll come back uh, and talk a little bit more about what, what our intentions for the project are, how we see it, um, how, you know, what, it, what is it? What is, what is the end result? And what, what will it look like? And, but also try to give a little bit, maybe even a little bit more uh, grounding to uh, W.B. Du Bois and, uh, and what he um, sort of has contributed and, and, and by um, giving us these portraits. Uh, so we'll begin. Let's share my screen just one second. Okay. So this is uh, an example of my work. I'm going to just briefly talk about my work and uh, uh, as an artist um, and as a uh, curator, um, which I put the curator hat on sometimes, but I I, I, I claim the artist uh, um, and I claim the the uh, the, the teacher uh, position maybe even more. Although I, I can't help myself when it comes to curating a show here or there. Um, largely because it allows me to, um, to uh, kind of insight into uh, research um, connected to uh, the images um, that I'm mining for my own work. Um, so it's a little self-serving, but also, uh, also a great way to engage communities uh, with the ideas that are in the work. Um, I think I'll start with just talking to you about what you're looking at in terms of material. Um, this is a, a rather large 80 inch by uh, 40 inch um, work on paper. Um, it is a texturally it is a is it a velvet is a black velvety paper. It's a very difficult thing to photograph uh, and see um, the textures because of the, the depth of the of the material, the depth of the black in the material. One which is one of the things that draws me to uh, the material itself. Um, um, the hands that you're seeing here are painted in acrylic. These are um, photographic collage and the white little sort of floral, um, uh, I guess, pieces that you're seeing there are actually cut from the black paper. And so you're looking through a hole or through an incision to, to, to the wall or to a white mat. Um, Here's a sort of close up of, of, of what the, the pieces, this piece actually is actually this piece. Um, so you can see the incisions, um, the kind of working on the back, the collaging from the verso, um, and, and, and how sort of physical and, and, and delicate that these things uh, tend to be. Um, I'm, I'm, in terms of content, I'm, I'm really interested in black being and um, making work around the conditions of, of, black, of black being, um, trying to understand what that is. W.B. Du Bois is really important to me in thinking through that with his idea of double consciousness. Um, he, he talks about um, you know, um, the, the notion that um, black people walk through the world in, in a type of double consciousness, consciousness where they're not, whereas an awareness of self, but also awareness of, of how others are, are um, looking and perceiving. In other words, there, and he says there's this sort of veil, this sort of veil between um, the world and, um, and black being. And um, I'm interested in that philosophical cons consent and um, how it speaks to the existential um, and what it means, what, what it means to try to image um, black being without necessarily imaging a, a person. Um, this is uh, a project that I did at USF Graphics Studio, the first collaboration we uh, did together. Um, this piece is um, called Palim Palimpsest. I should say that this piece is called uh, Black Metamorphosis. I am, I am interested in titles uh, and the titles become a way into the into the, the content of the work. 
Um, this is Palimpsest. Um, this is a is, this is a uh, I believe a 50, 50 by thirty. Um, I could be a little bit off um, on the on the size uh, of this piece. Um, we used silk screen, um, so this is a uh, the, the the hoods that you're the hoodies that you're seeing here is uh, is a photographic silk screen. Um, we um, went around the parking lots and um, around and around campus, and I did rubbings of the asphalt. Um, and we uh, made silk screen. We, we shot uh, silk screens. Um, I made plates from them, um, which then we pushed, you know, ink through um, to create this kind of um, surface in the background. We used a kind of puff paint, which is react, which reacts to heat and gets really puffy. So the background of this of this print is really is really textured. Um, I used. Um, 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 etching here with the hand, um, with, the, with the hands, and then we also um, used a, a laser cutter to uh, make the incisions here. So these are also all these little white specks that you see that are kind of floral are also incisions uh, in the paper itself. This was in 2018, I believe, we finished um, this project. Um, these are uh, recent paintings. Um, you know, I, 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 I should have led with this, but I, I, I kind of work across um, media, a number of media. So I, I make paintings, I make works on paper, I sometimes sculpt, and um, along with the, with the curating. Um, these, these are acrylic paintings with a uh, velvet flocking in the background. So you can see that, so the, in other words, the, the backgrounds are very plushy and soft. Um, there's, you'll see some forms here that are um, like the floral uh, cutout images that you saw in the previous work. There are also, these backgrounds have two different levels of, of you know, a, a thinner and thicker level of, of, of velvet flock on the back. Um, um, in these paintings, I'm trying to, you know, use still life um, to talk about um, how objects tell story can tell stories, very much looking at Dutch still life paintings uh, and um, European European paintings um, um, of the of the late 18th and 19th century, in which we would you would see a sort of black servant boy, um, you know, uh, sort of presenting their master with some sort of a sort of bounty. But also interested in the kind of Dutch painting, uh, in which momentum mori, in which um, you know, often had things like wilting flowers or, or, or that rotting fruit bugs that to to talk about you know this the kind of inevitability of death um, within the within this um, a more or less decadent society. Um, and so in these pieces, I, I am sort of pointing, using objects to point to notions of diaspora, to talk about um, um, the Black Atlantic, um, touch on um, the transatlantic slave trade, um, and, and also, I guess the, the, the real sort of question becomes, you know, this, uh, the, who does this history serve? And, and how and how how does it how does it serve us? Um, this is a recent sculpture. Um, um, I should I, I should say um, some titles again. So the, the the piece that you see on the uh, left side of the screen is called Feast with Nkizi. Um So you'll see Nkizi is a, is the African sculpture refers this to the African sculpture that is um, laying down. Um, with his head resting on the gun on this platter. And on the right, um, this is um, still life um, with aquarium. Um, of course, the, the, the um, painting focusing on the, um, the sort of African uh, sculpture that is submerged in the, in the fishbowl. Uh, this is a sculpture. Um, called Keep Your Head to the Sky. It's a, it's a sculpture, it's based on a song um, 
by Earth, Wind, and Fire. Um, there are all kinds of elements uh, along these gold along these gold chains. These are our eighteen karat gold plated chains. Um, they these are they're drinking gourds that are flocked with velvet co coated with with velvet fibers. Um, there are there's uh, black stones, tech tourmaline, quartz. Um, these objects speak to healing, they speak to navigation, they speak to wayfinding, um, and, um, and also sort of black labor in the materials, both in terms of talking about um, the materiality of gold and, and, it, and its colonial histories, but also its, um, its sort of more popular cultural connotations for me, which is, you know, when you like someone, you like a girl, you give her, you know, your gold chain um, as a sign of affection or a sign of, 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 of belonging together. I'm going to talk a little bit about Black Pulp. Um, so Black Pulp was an exhibition um, that uh, myself and Mark Thomas Gibson started in 2015 um, in terms of having conversations and building up to an eventual um, um, exhibition that started at Yale School of Art. Um, um, Mark was my student previously, uh, and then my co-collaborator in, the, in, in this project, um, which is an exhibition that featured over 60 objects of um, contemporary art and historic print media um, focused on talking about how um, Black writers, artists, um, um, and, and the Black press sort of uh, work towards building and building uh, a Black image after, uh, after emancipation after, and, and in the face of Jim Crow. Um, how, the story of how these publications, these illustrators um, were combating these sort of more derogatory uh, um, images of Black people, stereotypes, um, often with sardonic and sar sarcastic humor um, and an incredible amount of elegance and beauty, um, all within a kind of, um, and, and, and oftentimes in a, in a, in a very, in a very pulp or, or comic uh, and illustrative uh, sort of address. Um, so this Black pulp traveled to um, to uh, from Yale to the International Print Center in New York. Um, um, from from there um, to USF Wesleyan University and the Philadelphia African the African American uh, Museum in Philadelphia. Um, this is the USF iteration in uh, the Con the Contemporary Art Museum. Um, which it, where it was ex an extremely exquisite um, presentation um, of, of all the work. So the historic print media is here in the vitrines and um, contemporary art on the wall. Um, we, we, we also focused this on printmaking and on, 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 print mat, on printed matter. Um, so it was a really wonderful collaboration to be in conversation with Graphic Studio. Um, and of course, we also you know, you can see some of the objects in the background. We also, um, you know, inc included, um, we're able to include kind of some music here in the background as well um, in relationship to the type of imagery and, and works on display. Um, this is a few things. So the historic, you know, this, uh, this the historic, on the historic side, anything from the New Negro, which, we, which was maybe the sort of, um, beginning where the, the beginning of the story for Black Pulp as an exhibition really begins as this kind of dawning um, of of the, and, um, of a kind of self um, fashioned um, identity um, as um, as Black people through you know through the um, vision of Aaron, of um, Elaine Locke and with the illustration and, and dust jackets of Aaron Douglas, um, which were, there were many in, in the exhibition, onto, onto uh, Emory Douglas's amazing um, uh, 
illustrations for the Black Panther um, uh, Party um, newspaper. Um, we had rare comics um, such as Lobo, um, and which is, uh, I guess, one of the, the first standalone sort of black superhero, um, and um, and to um, this Billy Graham's uh, Luke Cage uh, pages of uh, comics. Um, many of these um, objects um, we were able to get from Emory University, um, from and from, and. and with environment from the Schomburg. Um, it's more of an example of the contemporary art. Um, many artists were in the show. These just happened to be a few. Carl Walker, uh, Cam Perigent Marshall, um, Derek Adams, Renee Cox, Alan Gallagher. So uh, in this in this way, um, the the kind of um, the kind of illustrative and pulp nature of the historic media met with um, contemporary artists who were engaged with the same type of questions and the same type of uh, uh, image world. Um, sort of making a conversation and an argument for how, um, how Black people fashion their image. I'm gonna stop here and uh, introduce to Shraddha Rami, um, who is our uh, urbanist and will be working on the research component of the Printing Black America project. Thanks. Hi. Okay. Um, so as Will said, I'm an urbanist. Um, I have a background in environmental studies and urban planning. Um, I work a lot with maps and data, and I'll be doing the research and data work for the Printing Black America project. Um, I see maps and data as a way to understand how cities are shaped by their natural environments and how they in turn can reshape those environments. Um, maps can show where people live and visualize demographic information about who they are. And by layering on multiple data sets in a map, maps can reveal insights about the relationships between people and places. So, um, I'd like to share a few examples of projects that I've worked on over the years. Um, this is a series of maps that I created to inform the development of an urban growth plan for the city of Guwahati in northeastern India. Um, it's in the foothills of the Himalayas. What you're looking at here is an image from Google Earth um, showing the historic um, urban growth of the city. Um, so right through the middle of the city is the Brahmaputra River. And you can see the dark red outline shows um, the original footprint of the city, which was just a small settlement on the river banks. Um, and then each consecutive line shows how the city expanded over time. And the outermost white line shows the planned extents of the city in um, 2025. This next map shows the topography of the city. So there are several large hills um, in, right within the city's borders. And what you can't see on this map is that this region ex experiences very heavy rainfall. Um, so urban growth as the city expands, as people's houses and roads expand, um, ca this causes deforestation and um, more paved surfaces are built, which replace soil and vegetation. And the pressures of urban growth also push people to live further up these hillsides into steeper terrain. And what ends up happening is during the rain, the heavy rains that happen in this region, um, the hillsides are no longer held together by the vegetation that used to grow there. And so they're more susceptible to landslides and also the paved surfaces don't allow the rainwater to soak into the soil. And so this causes um, flash flooding. Um, so on this map, you can see all the red dots are um, landslides that have happened. And the blue dots are reported urban flooding that has happened um, over in recent years. Um, and so these frequent natural disasters can cause damage to property and loss of life. Um, and here, this is 
a map of the uh, plan for future urban expansion uh, in the city and the areas of greatest proposed growth are um, these darkest areas. Um, and as you can see, these are areas where you can see landslides have occurred, flooding has occurred. And um, this series of maps helps to visualize this problem. So um, I created these maps for a nonprofit that was involved in the creation of a sustainable urban growth plan for the city. And they were able to use these maps as a planning tool to approach city officials, to approach community members, um, and provide a starting point for reconsidering this proposed um, growth plan. Um, moving on to another project, um, I worked at the Museum of City of of the city of New York, doing research for a show called New York at its core. Um, this is an exhibit on the history and future of New York City, and it addresses the question of what makes New York New York. Um, the part of the show I worked on is called the Future City Lab, and a major component of this exhibit is a map-based installation, which presents the challenges that face New York City today. Um, I did the research and data collection for this map to tell a story of the major challenges that the city's residents face, from the daily issues of housing affordability, reliable transportation, and jobs, to the looming threat of climate change, and then to how we can better live together as a multiracial and multi-ethnic society. Um, and so this map installation went through a series of videos with quotes and you know, images of people and um, different data sets visualized on the map and um, poses questions to the audience to consider how we can better develop in the future. Um, and most recently I worked for the city of New York to create a hazard mitigation plan. Um, this is the plan that examines all the likely hazards that can affect the city and looks at how we can lessen their impacts on the city and its residents. Um, maps are a major component of this plan and they help visualize the hazards and allow the public to better understand various risk factors. Um, so this is housed on a website to show you some of the maps. Um, so this um, page is called the Community Risk Assessment Dashboard, and it allows um, view visitors to the website to select the neighborhood in which they live and understand the hazards that impact their neighborhood. Um, so these are the hazards that impact the neighborhood that I chose, which is um, southern in Southern Brooklyn. Um, this is a map of the coastal storm evacuation zones that um, are in this neighborhood and around the city. Um, so you can see that all of this neighborhood is in an evacuation zone compared to in New York City, only about half of the city is in an evacuation zone. So this neighborhood is at much higher risk. Um, and then it also shows um, various other risk factors. You can see where um, coastal storms have hit this, um, hit the city in the past. So these are all historic tracks of coastal storms. Um, and you can also see demographic risk factors. So um, this one. So poverty is actually a major risk factor for most hazards because um, residents have, are rest, less resilient and um, have less ability to relocate and things like that. And so um, the population in this neighborhood is actually, has a lower poverty level than the rest of the city. Um, age is another risk factor. So age combined with poverty compounds the risk. So um, children under five are higher risk, people 65 are, and older are at higher risk. So. This, you can really, as a community member, go in, look at the map, see how you compare to the rest of the city and help inform how you might respond in your neighborhood to a disaster. 
Um, I'm going to stop there with my work and move to talking about um, the project that we're here to discuss. So um, before we dive into the project, I'd like to talk about the data visualizations that W.E.B. Du Bois created that are the basis for our work. Um, so this is a, a photo of the American Negro exhibit, which was part of the Exposition Universelle in Paris in 1900. Um, it was organized by Thomas Junius Calloway. It included objects, images, um, photographs, and publications and a series of 63 data visualizations created by W.B. Du Bois specifically for the show. Um, and they all uh, were about Black American life. Um, so to put this in the social context at the time, um, the larger exposition that this was part of fully embraced social Darwinist theories of civilization. They presented views of Europeans and Anglo-Americans lifting up the non-white races with their vision of in industrialization and progress. And um, in comparison, the American Negro exhibition showed the gains that Black Americans had made in the very short time since emancipation, in spite of living within a white supremacist uh, culture, and it challenged the framework of the larger exhibition. Um, so uh, Du Bois created 63 data visualizations for the exhibition. Um, at the time, he was teaching at Atlanta University, which is now Clark Atlanta. And he worked with a team of students and alumni to create a collection of graphs, charts, maps, and tables. He used data from the census, government reports, and data collected by his uh, sociological laboratory at the university. Um, the visualizations are divided into two studies. The first uses data from the state of Georgia, which at the time had the largest Black American population of any state. Um, it was used as a case study to demonstrate the progress made by Black Americans since the Civil War. And then the second study um, zooms out to take a more national and global view, um, comparing the Black population of the US to other countries. Um, the 19th century was a time when um, the availability of data grew very quickly and um, the use of charts and graphs and maps to visualize data was uh, becoming more common. Um, du Bois was building on the foundations laid by his predecessors in the field of information graphics, and he was really pushing the aesthetics of data visualization at the time. Um, he moves past the conventions of bar graphs and pie charts um, and really plays with the form. He uses spirals and loops and these crazy spikes in this chart um, to create these very striking graphics. And at the time, these were all hand-drawn and painted and colored. Um, and today, the, they live in the Library of Congress and they're unlikely to ever be exhibited again because they're old and fragile. Um, Will is going to talk in a little bit more about the aesthetics of um, these pieces. Um, so the visualizations focus primarily on Black Americans with very few comparisons to the white American population. Um, the message conveyed in these charts are of the immense progress made by Black Americans in the space of a generation. So this chart shows that in 1860, 89% of Black Americans were enslaved. And just 30 years later, almost a fifth of Black Americans own the land that they farm on. Um, this is uh, other, there's other charts that show the economic part participation of Black families, talks about the jobs that they did, the businesses they owned, how they spent their money. Um, this is a chart that shows um, down here, on, down on the left side, it shows um, the income levels. And then across here, you see how people at various income levels spend their money on rent, food, clothing, um, taxes, and other, um, other expenses. 
Um, and other data visualizations focus more on the cultural, cultural contributions of Black Americans, such as newspapers, religious organizations, and religious, um, or sorry, educational attainment. And this is from uh, the more national and global study. This is a chart that compares the literacy rate among Black Americans to European countries. So these are the countries that are doing better than Black Americans, but you can also see that there's countries like Russia and Romania that are significantly worse um, than Black America. So really overall, he's, uh, Du Bois is painting a positive and hopeful outlook for Black Americans at the time. Um, and I'm gonna turn it back to Will to talk about her project. Hey, so this is our project, uh, Printing Black America, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois's data portraits in the 21st century. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna sort of maybe talk a little bit about Du Bois as well um, as we move through these. And uh, I feel like I need to comment on this beautiful uh, portrait uh, of, a, of a family here um, amongst all the things that one that Du Bois uh, did, he also um, took it upon himself to collect uh, um, images of Black folk throughout this, uh, the, the, the work he was doing in terms of the actual studies. Um, so there, you know, with this, um, with this archive of, of data visualizations of the Library of Congress also comes this incredibly beautiful um, archive of, of photographs um, of Black people um, at the turn of the uh, 20th century. Um, so this is W.E.B. Du Bois uh, at around 30 years old. By this time, he was one of the first Black people to receive a master's degree from Harvard University and had already written the seminal text, The Souls of Black Folk, which even for his toughest critics was a remarkable work of American literature and the first writing that derives on the existential conditions of blackness. Uh, the image next to Du Bois um, was published, uh, is a book um, that was published in 2018 and edited by Whitney Battle Baptiste and Britt and Brit Russert. It is the first book to digitize, uh, to digitize and bring the entire archive of W.E.B. Du Bois's um, visualizations for the 1900 American Negro exhibit in Paris into one publication. Um, the actual visualizations, as uh, Strada mentioned, are uh, housed in the Library of Congress. And, and, and again, due to the fragile nature uh, of the works, they're not likely to ever see in the light of day again. Um, so just a bit about the, the aesthetics. Um, you know, Du Bois proved to be ahead of his uh, time in every way imaginable. And, um, and it's not a coincidence that the aesthetics of the data portraits um, were not only, you know, uh, they were not only groundbreaking in the space of sociology and data visualization, they also were engaged uh, with the current arguments of design and form at the dawn of the 20th century. Um, while, we while we are speculating, um, it's not uh, so hard to see the, the relationships of both form and content to the discussions emerging uh, from the famed Bauhaus School in Germany, which considered the interplay of geometry and color to be at the heart of good design. Um, further arguments from the Bauhaus uh, would consider design to be a way to a better future. Uh, so uh, you have uh, Du Bois's uh, that are portraits over here, two examples on the uh, right of the screen and on the left, some, ex some examples um, um, going clockwise of um, painting coming out of the Bauhaus, uh, graphic design poster of Haji, also an, also an architect, and, um, and an example of de steel uh, furniture, which is also a design movement uh, coming out of the Bauhaus at the um, beginning of the 20th, the 20th century.
So what do we envision? Um, you know, the end result of the research that uh, Shraddha will conduct for printing Black America um, is a bound folio of prints that takes into consideration the full archive of Du Bois' project. Uh, we intend to use current data, current data visualization methods and aesthetic and, and aesthetic form to create new visualizations, revisiting, uh, revisiting these, these uh, Du Bois' project in the 21st century. Um, again, as Shraddha suggested earlier, we believe that Du Bois' Du Bois's questions are still current in relationship to Black life in America. And our goal is to understand and be challenged by the portraits that we find. Um, you know, uh, Shraddha mentioned the kind of, um, a kind of this kind of hopeful um, uh, portrait that, that the portraits sort of ultimately give us uh, in relationship to uh, Black life at the turn of the 20s or, or after emancipation um, at the dawn of the 20th century. Um, and um, we, we, you know, we, we might think um, about how um, that is going to change, you know, in relationship to what we find through 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 the research. Um, so the image that you're looking at is um, an offset lithography print portfolio by the artist Charles White, uh, which includes which includes um, a forward by civil rights activist and singer, Harry Belafonte. Um, as the story goes, uh, White, uh, Charles White, at the height of his, of his career, excuse me, recognized that black people were less in attendance at his uh, openings of his exhibition and many could no longer afford uh, his work anymore. So he decided to produce editions of prints. So of, of these offset, you know, the faux prints, uh, so that the work would still be accessible. Um, so we included this portfolio, this portfolio, by the way, in, in the Black Pulp exhibition. So this, 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 this actual, um, maybe not this actual one, but um, a, a, an addition, um, a, a full, a full edition folio like this was included in Black Pulp and and, and already, you know, at USF at, at that point in time. Um, All right, lost my place. So, you know, uh, I was really moved um, by White's story ever, ever since this, we, we found it through our research in Black Pulp. I, I think part of uh, that has just stated and, and it's, it somehow uh, ties into the story of how we've, got, we've come to get to the project. So much of the spirit of what we're doing within this, this project really is about accessibility and the understanding that these you know, precious jewels of history will not last or will not be accessible to, to most you know, people. Um, so we're inspired you know, by the calls in Battle Baptiste and Russert's book um, that, I, that, I, that I showed earlier. We're, we're inspired by the calls in that book for scholars and artists to kind of pick up you know, this, the work that the boys did um, and, and study them uh, and thereby keep them in memory and in, in, a, in a kind of learning um, uh, process, um, you know, in, into, the, in, into the future. These are, um, so here, here's some examples of print portfolios. So, you know, um, I said a lot, but. It, when, when it comes down to it, I want to kind of give everybody a kind of sense of what we're looking, what we're talking about as a, as a kind of material, you know, a, a material object that this, um, that printing Black America ultimately will be. Um, it will also be a digital project, but um, it'll also be, have this sort of um, um, phys physical form um, of a portfolio. So these are, these are, uh, uh, per portfolios that were created at USF over, over the years. Um, um, they happen to be pretty amazing. Um, um, you know, looking at Mark Diane's World of the Box, how incredibly beautifully crafted um, this, this is as, as an object. When you open that up, there are prints, there are prints inside there. Um, so we, you know, we, and we envision the Printing Black America project to be kind of similar uh, in, in you know, in, 
and its construction. Um, you know, and we hope to um, engage you know all forms of printmaking available at the graphic studio. Hopefully, even um, finding ways in which to com to combine um, print printmaking processes and the creation of the project. Um, and to to be even more clear, um, you know, Shrada will be doing the will be doing the research component of this and the, and the initial data visualizations. And my job is to then take those, um, those visualizations and begin asking questions about form and how we, how we may push form, um, but also how we, how we can see, the, see, the, see them within the, within the medium of, of printmaking um, as well. So, so, so the project is just as is, is much about a, a kind of act of printmaking it as it is an act of uh, social science. Um, we will be aided in our efforts by historian Nell Urban Painter, Edwards Professor of American History Emerita at Princeton University and prolific author who has written volumes on the histories attending American life. In recent years, Nell has received her MFA as and has lived, lived to write about it, um, as you can see here. She is now uh, an artist, um, as much as a historian, um, and um, will write a short essay <clears throat> within, the, within the Printing Black America portfolio. She'll also be making a frontispiece print um, for our print edition, for the print edition. Um, so as an, as an artist <clears throat> and a historian, she'll help position the project relative to persistent historical questions of race. And you can see some of Nell's books here on the side. Um, very popular old and art school. Uh, um, most recently, the Southern History Across the Color Line and um, the History of White People, which is uh, how I came to, um, to, to begin to know and read it and understand uh, Nell's work. Um, here's Nell as well, well, being a badass painter. And uh, Stacy, a social scientist, Stacy Sutton, will also join in advising our project. She is currently Associate Professor of Urban Planning and Policy at the College of Urban Planning and Public Affairs at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, we hope to include a short essay within the Printing Black America uh, project um, by Sutton as well. Her scholarship on race and economics will go, give us a, deep under, a deeper understanding of the current conditions surrounding Black life. We also hope to collaborate with students at USF to achieve our research goals. And uh, last but not least, um, we'd like to thank the Social Science Research Councils and American Dilemma for the 21st century digital platform for, for awarding um, this project uh, grant funding that will help us begin our research component. We intend to use the incredible archive of studies to further ground our project by citing historical context relevant to our, visual, our visualizations. And with that, I'm going to stop our share, screen share, and we we want time for uh, you know for for Q and A, but I thought maybe it might be just nice to after all of the you know after all of the professional um, stuff we just said to just sort of. Um, maybe take a moment and just think about, like, talk about maybe why we have gotten involved in this. In, in this, so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Shrada, you know, what do you as a you know you you're you're working within this very um, very practical, um, very real world um, place as an urban planner, um, often working directly. Um, with communities, uh, cities, resources. What, from your perspective, and whether that's like, you know, your education, what, what kind of makes you 
interested in what Du Bois is, is doing with these, these studies. What makes the research interesting to you? Yeah, um, there's several different aspects of it. Um, first of all, Du Bois is, you know, one of the fathers of sociology he was um, very, uh, was very um, meticulous with the way that he did his research, with the way that he collected his data, the way that he chose to present it. And um, as a data nerd, I'm very excited to kind of follow in his footsteps and be able to replicate what he did in our current day. And especially considering that um, everything that he talked about is still very relevant today. I think it uh, feels like a very valid approach to examining these questions again. Um, and I am also, I love the aesthetics of the project but as you saw, um, my work samples, most of them are online and digital. And I'm very excited to push outside of that into um, a physical printmaking space um, and consider the possibilities of that as a new medium. And also to have conversations around this work um, outside of the urban planning field, you know, to engage more with students, with artists, and um, talk about it in different ways. I would ask you the same question to this room. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's so many things. I think, um, I think for me, it, it really was, um, it, it does tie back to, to Black Talk and having done that exhibition and having dealt with, um, archives that were really turning to dust, you know, going to, you know, we did a lot of our research and we had a lot of the objects at, em at Emory University. And, you know, there are these, these amazing, amazing things that are sort of sitting um, and that nobody will ever really see and, and, and that haven't been sort of digitized or, or dealt with. And I think I didn't, I don't think I thought so much about that um, the fragility of, of that and then and therefore like right the fragility of of, his, of history of like you know how we understand history um, until we did that sort of research so be kind, I think it kind of for me it, it all comes kind of back to the to the art and my work as an artist um, so um, you know not only is it the printed matter aspect but um, but it's how these, it's, it's how these, um, he called them portraits, right? So it's, it's how they actually tell a story of, of, of blackness, how they become a type of portrait without you know, rendering uh, a, a, a representation of a, of a person, which is something that I'm really interested in in my work. You know, the, 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 the work um, tries to get at questions around, um, um, black, um, black being without sort of making a sort of, you know, a, a, direct, a direct, direct portrait of a person. So I'm very interested in, in that aspect of how these sort of, you know, shapes, you know, uh, geometric shapes and, and, and you know, uh, primary colors um, all kind of combine to kind of give you a kind of image of, of, of people. Um, you know, and at a particular time, um, and you know, and 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 I do think you're right. I think the questions are still very, very, very real, um, and I'm interested in you know, I'm, I'm really interested in what we find, right? Like in in relationship to the 20th century and the types of questions that we can ask um, about the 21st century, you know, through you know, through the um, through this through this project and. And through you know through through really the, the types of questions to boys was looking at right um, as well. Now I'll, I'll maybe stop there. Um, hey, uh, hey, Mike, Mark. Hey, <laughs> that's our cue to. Right. Well, I thought I'd 
yeah, we don't we don't have any questions as yet, but I, I've got a few that I'd love to ask. And if anyone you know wants to jump in at this point, they can uh, put a question in the chat during the Q and A, and we can we can get to it. Um, my first question is about um, so so what is it like? For if students do want to participate, we've got, you know, we've got anthropology, social work, uh, honors college, you know, what, what kinds of things might students be doing if they were to, to participate in this project? Yeah, I um, really think that the participation of the students is very much in the spirit of the way that Du Bois did his work initially and so I think that's very important to us to bring that into the project too um, and I think also the participation of students will really help ground um, the work in a community and in in a place um, the way that Du Bois did in Atlanta and in Georgia um, so I think um, we'd love to engage with students in data collection and their research questions that might relate to, you know, the questions that come up in this project and in working with creating visualizations with them and seeing, um, I mean, this work is so rich that I feel like there's a lot more to be done than just what we hope to do. So I think there's a lot of ways that student work can um, enrich and add on to, um, to this project. Awesome, thanks. I was uh, <clears throat> in looking at some of the the data visualizations that came up. I, I was looking at particularly one. It involved like the uh, amount of monthly income of Black peoples and how they spent their money in the chart there, and it it got me thinking. Did did Du Bois speak much to racial consciousness and its intersection with? Uh, you know, black peoples. It, 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 was that a was that part of his research? Uh, the the concept of of class, a, a stratification. That it it just it sparked my interest. It, the chart did, and I I thought I'd ask you guys about it. I'm trying. To, I'm looking at the chart. Can you pull it up? Yeah. We're just gonna we're just gonna pull it up to, to, to make sure I'm talking. We're talking about the same thing. Oh, this this chart that we showed. I think he was definitely trying to show that Black Americans at the time were far from like a single um, category of people that they spanned, you know, vast array of jobs and careers and economic uh, strata. So I think. In that way, he's definitely trying to bring that up in this research. But well, yeah, I think you know, I, I would be a little bit skeptical about like a kind of I would say class, you know, like as as it directly. Um, I think he was really looking at the at the black community, and particularly in the Georgia study here, in comparison to you know itself, like what. So like what institutions are being built, how, is, how are economies, how are they building an economy and, you know, in the middle of this kind of world, you know. Um, so the, it's, it speaks much, it, 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 it speaks less to class division than it does, and I think more to kind of like sort of collaboration, uh, you know, sort of um, collaborative economics um, and how that, how that is, is helping you know these communities to actually build economies so that they don't actually need to uh, i think have have to deal every on the on an everyday basis with these kind of um, um fissures of class right notion notion of class that would you know even even further sort of maybe belittle um belittle them in terms of their you know their humanness at a particular time or that when that was kind of like you know an everyday you know, experience outside of the community um, for Black people. I am also real interested in in um, the 
aesthetics, you know, you're drawing a parallel between uh, Du Bois's original portraits and, and aesthetic forms and things happening at the same time. And I, I wonder, it, it, it seems it, it's got to be an open question at this point, but I wonder um, if, if there is any uh, vision for, for how um, the aesthetics of this project can relate to our current moment. You know, and I, I guess that's not something, it's not something that's easy to talk about. It's more easy to look at, right? But but I'm curious if you uh, have any ideas about how how the, the, these things can be related in the project, right? Does that make sense, that question? Well, I mean, there is a kind of, right, there is a kind of a, there is a kind of aesthetics to that of visualization, or at least there are maybe, you could speak to maybe types of ways in which, you know, um, data can be is visualized, like, as, like now, as opposed to in the, you know, early 20th century. Yeah, I mean, um, I think people recently, since the publication of this book, have been very, um, you know, have worked with his visualizations in all kinds of ways. And so I was, well, I was preparing for this talk, I found someone has, you know, created this uh, data visual, digital visualization renderer that you can plug in your own data into, and it comes out looking like one of these charts that Du Bois uh, <laughs> made, you know, so there's a lot of ways to play with it. But also, I think so much of the way that he created these visualizations is now like in in the visual language of data visualization already you know just the clean colors clean you know like very um i don't know the kinds of fonts that he uses the typography the layouts all of it is kind of in the conventions that we use today and um it'll be interesting to see how we can push that to the edge the way that he pushed you know past the conventions of his time so i'm excited to see where we go Mark, I see there are a couple of questions coming through. Uh, I wonder what you were talking and asking your own yeah. question. Uh, Melissa M writes, I was late, so please disagree, disregard if already discussed, but will any of this project touch on what Du Bois did in Ghana? Well, no, um, I think we're, we're, we're focusing you know, on, on these, 63, you know, visualization on the and on, on this this particular uh, piece as as a project. So I mean, you know, when you when you start talking about the boys, it's like you know, it's <laughs> it's an amazing what this person was able to accomplish in one lifetime, um, and how um, how he was able to to move around the world, even though he spent I don't know. 20, 20 years, 15 to 20 years of his life, um, grounded by the U.S. government, um, the connections and and uh, and with around the globe that he was able to make are incredible. Well, maybe you were you're were just content. answering you're just answering Walter Jennings' question. Uh, du Bois has always had a reputation of being a staunch intellectual. It's really fascinating to see a creative expression side of his work, are there any other instances of him incorporating this practice? Did he do other kind of visualizations? Um, well, right after this book, he published this whole study on Philadelphia um, called The Philadelphia Negro, where he does similar you know, research and um, uh, renderings of, of Black lives in Philadelphia, but also the course of my research, I've found poetry that he's written, sci-fi fiction, like he he really did all of it. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, and one of the and one of the most amazing things that you know that the boys is responsible for is um, the, the Crisis magazine. And um, he was editor of uh, the Crisis magazine, which was the official publication of the NAACP and it's and and he helped found the NAACP by the way and um, was the chief editor 
of uh, the Crisis Magazine. And that magazine was right a journal, not only of, um, not only of, uh, of editorial um, um, and sort of you know hard news, but it also was a was a journal that included poetry, um, amazing illustrations, and, um, and uh, covers by like Aaron, you know artists like Aaron Douglas, um, many of which were in the Black Pulp exhibition. So um, if it, it it almost seems like if it was if it was something that was happening at the at, with Black people. You know, at the turn of the 20th century, Du Bois was in the room somewhere. <laughs> yeah, he, you know, he famously wrote. You know, he he wrote. Uh, he had a, wrote letters between Augusta Savage uh, and, and defended uh, defended her when she was sort of um, um, sort of kicked out of sort of the Beaux Arts school in, in Paris or, or, or not accepted. Um, you know, helped her. You know, get. You know, to uh, to the Works Progress Progress Administration and be a, be a kind of administrator. So it just goes on and on and on and on. Um, it's, it's quite amazing. Yeah. Well, it sounds like there's lots of topics that can be pursued as this project moves forward. And I want to thank uh, Mark for organizing it and Will and Treda for giving us a little. Um, uh, a little bit about your work, your practice, and how that will be realized in this uh, project that you're that we're just beginning to develop. Um, we invite people, and Mark can add to this, to let us know if they're interested in participating. But already we have um, Andrew Hargrove from the College Honors College, who has some done work in the area of data visualization. Antoinette Jackson in anthropology continues to be a, a, a great collaborator and Sandra Vogel in social work. And so this project brings together, of course, my interest, our interest in the Institute for Research and Art and printmaking with the social sciences. And we look forward to, to finding a way to realize this project. It may take us a while, but we can certainly introduce it in parts as it moves forward. And we explore all the printmaking techniques that may come to bear. And we look forward to seeing Shreda, uh, Shreda's um, research uh, so that you can uh, map new forms of visualization. Um, so thank you tonight for doing this all the way from Rome. I should have mentioned that Will uh, was awarded the Prix de Rome, and so that's why they're in Rome. And how long, how much longer will you be there? Um, I was awarded the Rome Prize, and yeah, we yeah. are we are here for one year. Um, one year. Starting from, we've been here since September. Well, that must be a, a whole new life for you. And hope, um, thank you for continuing to connect with us on the development of this project. We appreciate it. And we'll look forward to your return to the United States and coming to Florida uh, as we advance this project. So thank you all for joining us tonight. And we look forward to seeing you at the Contemporary Art Museum. And please let us know your interest if you're a student or faculty in participating in this project. Mark, should I add anything else? No, I think that's a great way to tie things up here. Yeah. All right, well, thank you for being with us tonight. And uh, I hope you get some sleep and thank you for staying up so late. Bye-bye. <laughs> All right, thanks. Thank you.